So I want to, uh, I've done this maybe a million times now. Uh, what I want to do is I want to see what your expectations are and then take it from there. Uh, because there are many ways to cover this topic uh, and I would like to make it as much interactive as possible. Uh, so I'm going to do, I'm going to kick start with a small activity that will help me understand what is the audience like and then we will tailor the, the 60 minute work demonstration slash presentation in, in, in based on that. So this is on behavior driven development and we're going to be writing some code, we're going to be uh, doing a demonstration, we're also going to be covering some concepts behind what is behavior driven development, where it comes from. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, I would not distinguish between acceptance test driven development and behavior driven development. Uh, I know Dan North who coined the word uh, behavior driven development. Uh, might not be very happy with that, uh, but for this presentation I do not distinguish between the two. Uh, that's more of a philosophical discussion, right, why you don't believe in God kind of a discussion, right, which we're not going to go there right now. I want to form three groups, all right. This is uh, not a big audience, so we can easily do three groups. I want to form three groups and in your groups I want you to tell me what are specific observable results that will tell you the activity that we are going to list after this uh, that it's successfully completed. So what I want is at the end of 10 minutes or 5 minutes actually, uh, what are specific observable results that will tell us that you've completed the activity successfully, all right. Uh, so before I show the activities because then everyone wants to be in the one group which is really the nice group to be in, uh, I want to separate them out into three groups. And I see that there are a bunch of people from the same company sitting next to each other. So now is a good time to separate them into different groups. So we'll start there and you're going to say one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So all the ones will be in one group, all the twos will be in another group, all the threes will be in another group. I want to go through this really quick because this is just a warm up exercise that will help me understand who's in the room. All right. So we'll start there. <laughs> okay, well, we'll come put eat that row and come here. It's not that difficult, guys. <laughs> All right. Quick, quick, I don't want to spend 10 minutes on counting. All right, so all the ones together in this corner of the room. All the twos in this corner of the room. Group number three is going shopping and they have $50 to spend. All right. So I want you to tell me what are specific observable results that will tell us that you have successfully completed your respective activity. Group 1 will tell me what are specific observable results that will tell me that you have successfully watched the movie THX sound system with digital projection. All right. Group 2 going out for a meal, group 3 uh, going shopping. If the group feels too big you can split into two groups right? amongst you guys. So it is a five minute exercise, it's not a very detailed, in-depth philosophical discussion, it's a quick discussion. Somebody in your group should know, if not make the necessary assumptions. <laughs> make the necessary assumptions. Four minutes to go. All 
All right, thank you guys. You can come back and take a seat. Uh, you, you, who's going to present from your group? Who's going to present back your specific observable results? One should. <laughs> All right. So you're going to volunteer so the rest of them can sit back in their positions. That should be okay. Parimal, are you going to present? Okay, you're going to present. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Uh, can we have a mic, please? Or you can just use this. Uh, okay, first is uh, movie tickets. Movie tickets. Uh, second is uh, THX certificate. Who's going to give the THX certificate? THX certified. THX, sorry, THX certified theater. Okay. Uh, uh, third one is uh, uh, same digital pro uh, projection information of theater, something like that. And. Uh, Third one is uh, time duration of a movie. That time. we have spent this much time, you know, in a theater to watch movie. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's I good. That's it. Thank you. I didn't get your name. Vidhi. Vidhi. Yeah. Vidhi representing the first group. Thank you. We'll go to group number two. Uh, you can pass the mic, please, over there. So this group went out for a meal and one amongst you was a vegetarian. So what are specific observable results that will tell me you've successfully completed that activity? Okay, uh, the list may not be comprehensive, but some of the uh, things have been identified. Uh, whether the location serves uh, vegetarian and non-vegetarian food. Second is, do we actually have the budget for it and what's the contribution for it? And then uh, time, at what time you want to go? Would it be in morning? La snacks or maybe lunch or dinner so we had to find that, that would be one measurable thing uh, the third one was what's the mode of travel mode of travel okay. mode of travel to uh, all right yeah, yeah. next and uh, last list of members will be their team members the team members will be there okay cool hold on to that thought we'll go to the third group the gentleman in the red t-shirt the red shirt um, I think we kept it very simple. We we are out shopping and we have to spend fifty dollars. So uh, how? What are these observable results? It's uh, the products that we shop. The products yeah. that you shop. Yeah. Okay. We have it with us, uh, and to prove that it was about fifty dollars or exact fifty dollars, we had the receipts, which would potentially add up to fifty dollars. So the receipts, receipts and the products, if possible, and if the products were going to be shipped later, then the receipt was suffice. But you still have the receipt, but not the product. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's all right. All. So we have three groups, kind of at quite different levels of what we are looking at in terms of specific observable results for this activity, right? Or in other words, what people call as acceptance criteria, right? What is the acceptance criteria? So, what do you guys feel in general? Like, are we guys doing good on our acceptance criteria? How many for this? How many for this? Okay, so you're in the right workshop because when you leave, you would be doing this. <laughs> All right, uh, time for a commercial break. My name is Naresh Jain, probably you've heard me enough. Uh, I live in Mumbai. Uh, I don't act in Bollywood, but I've been trying. I have few people staying in my building who do, but I've not yet got a chance. Uh, I've started these different conferences and communities. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I build, uh, I have two startup companies. Uh, one helps kids learn mental arithmetics. Another one is uh, a conference marketplace. I've worked for uh, these following companies either as a consultant or as an employee. And now we have two things we can do from here. We could go in and do a deep dive into me showing a demonstration of how I would go about doing this. Or we could go back and cover some theory around why I did this activity. Which way would you like, guys like to go? Deep dive? Forget the theory? Both. <laughs> 
I'm going to just take a quick two minutes to talk about the activity that we did. The objective of the activity is a lot of times when we are given some requirements or some specification saying this needs to be done, we as developers, as software uh, professionals, we immediately kind of start thinking about what are the steps involved, how do we break this down, and how do we attack the problem, right? Rarely do we ask, why the heck would somebody want to do that? Why the heck somebody wants to go for a movie? That too in a digital projection and a THX sound system, what are they trying to get out of this? Right? What was the goal? What was the goal of going for the movie? Enjoyment. But all the things do, that you talked about in terms of your specific observable results, do they have anything to do with enjoyment? It makes a difference in terms of your experience, but maybe there is more to it, right? And we didn't really go into the details of that. Same thing with food. You guys were talking about transportation. You guys were talking about this. What was the purpose of going out for a meal? Eating out, enjoying, did any of those things have anything to do with enjoying? They seem like all fairly boring stuff, right? Uh, shopping guys were pretty close, right? What do you really care about is the products that you bought. But what's interesting is that, you know, where you're going out for your weekly grocery shopping versus where you're going out for a sale, you know, some kind of a sale shopping. In one case, you would have a laundry list of things that you want to buy, and you would verify if you've actually bought those things at the end of it. And even though you have $50, you want to spend as little money as possible, right? It's not about spending $50. It's about how can I get everything that I wanted in as little as I can get. And if I'm going out for a sale, I don't know what I want to buy, but I want to get the best deal out in there, right? So if you think from that perspective, ask why try and understand what is the goal, you probably will come up with better acceptance criteria, better you know, things that will help you validate and drive what you're trying to get at. So that's a nutshell of what this talk is all about. And I want to actually demonstrate that rather than just talk about it. All right? Cool. So that's the theory part. Now we'll do the actual stuff. How many people have used a coffee vending machine? Okay, that's good. So others of those who have not, there are some machines kept out there. You can take a break now, look at one and come back, or we can just continue with the problem. So let's imagine this is the, uh, and I, I'm sure you can't really read the text on the screen, but it's not supposed to be. It's a requirement document. It should be fairly detailed, right? So I have a requirement given by the business saying that I need to build a coffee vending machine. And let's assume for a minute that we are the first ever company building a coffee vending machine. All right? And we have to build a coffee vending machine. We have to design the hardware as we go along. And we have to figure out what dependencies we have and how we're going to build the system. All right? Uh, there are, we, we've, the business has decided it's done some market research and it's figured out that if they charge 35 cents for the coffee, they will uh, make enough profits out of it, all right? And they want to offer four different types of coffees based on the market survey they did. And those are the four coffee types that is being listed there, black, cream, sugar, and sugar and cream coffees, all right? We have to decide all the stuff, and there are some basic operations that they have dis discussed in terms of what they think, you know, accepting money, doing a coffee selection and stuff like that. So given this problem, right, like we gave you the last problem, how would you attack this problem? How would you go about building this coffee vending machine? Anyone? Basic operations. Any other approach? Who would do a flow chart? How the user will use the system? So some kind of a use case analysis? What would the user do and what is the expected behavior from the system? Okay. Anything else? What are they doing now? And what would it, what can we do to make that different, to make that better? All right, great. Do a prototype and get some early feedback, right? Right. 
try to understand how the machine should interact with the user, right? So do some kind of an interaction design. You guys are way smarter than me, right? I would just start writing code. How many people would come and put a coin inside this? One person, that's good for me, right? Free coffee vending machines, so no, no coins. We need to tell the user what to do, right? Because we are building the first coffee vending machine, so we need to tell the user what to do. So let's say we have some kind of a display. We're not going to have a touch screen at this point, right? 35 cents, it's not going to cut it. Uh, so we're going to have a simple display which is going to say, please select a coffee type. How about that, right? Let's say there are four buttons. They can be like this, they can be like this. We are not doing a product design. We are just trying to figure out what the interaction will be so we can actually drive the behavior of the system writing some behavioral tests, okay? So let's say there are four buttons. One is for black coffee, one is for black coffee with cream, one is for black coffee with sugar, one is black coffee with sugar and cream, all right? So we have these four different buttons and let's say the user selects black coffee with sugar, all right? Then what should happen? It should tell you what is the amount that you should be inserting into this machine, right? It should say, please insert 35 cents. So there should be a place for us to insert the 35 cents. Let's say I put in a dollar or I put in a hundred rupee if it was a 35 rupee coffee, right? And then what should happen? It should do some validation that it's actually a right coin or a right currency because when I was in the US, I would put steel coins into it to see and get stuff out of it, right? So we have people like me, so we have to do some validation. Uh, once we do the validation, we know that they've inserted actually one dollar, then we would say, okay, please collect your coffee. Uh, so there should be some place where they can actually get the coffee and some place where they would get their change of 35 cents. Uh, sorry, change of 65 cents in this case. All right, so they get the change, they get the coffee, they're happy, we are happy, what should happen after that? Go back to the initial state so that when the next person comes in, it takes, off, takes out from there, right? It starts off from there. Uh, so this is just a very simple happy path case that we've talked through, one simple interaction with the system. What happens if you're out of coins, right? I put in one dollar, the machine does not have five cents change. What should happen? So we talk through a few scenarios like this so we understand what the interaction would be, all right? So if if somebody doesn't have, if we don't have five cents change, what should we do? Give the dollar back, which is why they don't make engineers make business decisions. <laughs> right? Don't lose 30 cents for five cents. Bad business. Right? Rather give that away. Yeah, so there are other, other personas that you would have in the system who, you know, there are personas for maintaining this machine, there are personas, you know, which would fit into this case where somebody has to fill in the milk, somebody has to fill in other things, somebody has to make sure the coins are in there. So there are other personas, but I'm just, uh, for a one hour session, I'm just going to take a very simplistic view, all right? So we need to quickly discuss through a few scenarios to understand how a particular persona is going to interact with your product, right? It could be a website, it could be something else, it could be an iPhone app, doesn't matter, right? So it's important for us to understand what they are trying to do and what is the simplest way to achieve that, right? And typical projects, we spend about a week doing the product discovery phase, kind of doing, looking at this at a very high level. And then we say, okay, now it's time to hack some code, right? How many people for that? Nobody. That's good. So you're in the right session. I am going to write some code at this point because I've understood enough about the system I had to. I've looked through a few scenarios and I'm going to switch over and uh, let's just do, are people comfortable with a language called gibberish? Yeah. 
So I'm just creating a simple project here. I'm going to create a test folder over here. And that should be pretty much it. So I'm going to start with what is referred to as an acceptance test or a behavioral test. That's the first thing I would do. Ignore all of this stuff because this is pretty much uh, platform agnostic. It should not matter. So I'm going to call this acceptance test. Is everyone able to see this? Yes, OK. Acceptance test or behavior test. I'm going to later also show you a few other tools like Cucumber and things like that where you can do something similar. Uh, so I'm not going to focus too much on the tool. I'm going to focus more on the technique. All right. Uh, so I've got an acceptance test, right? So the question to ask is, what's the simplest scenario through this product that you would like to exercise? What is the simplest thing end to end that somebody can do with this thing, with this coffee vending machine? Insert money, get the coffee. That's too big a step. See the menu, select a coffee, all interesting things. But the problem is they are not end to end. They don't really give you any business value, right? So we want to do something which is end to end, but yet simple so we can actually do it uh, and get some early feedback, right? So what I'm going to do, and to me the simplest thing to do, uh, assuming there are a bunch of other validations we have done in terms of pricing and stuff like that, is I would take the simplest kind of coffee, which is black coffee, and I would say, if I insert the exact change, then I should get the black coffee, right? So what I've done is I've taken the interactions that we discussed, the behavior that we expect, and I've sliced out something which is end to end, but is the simplest path through the system, right? So I'm going to say, serve black coffee. for exact change, if I can type. All right. So let's assume that is a scenario we want to cover. All right. That's the that simplest scenario we can find that we want to cover. Now, what is the thing that you know, the user would do? Here's the interesting portion of this whole thing. Right? So what would the user do? What's the first thing? I want to actually step back and say, you know, I have a brand new machine. The first thing I need to do is power it up. All right. So let's say we say power up. And then it should say display. Please select a coffee type. No, no, no. The black forcefully is in your head not in the machine, right? So you still want the machine to behave as if it would behave normally, but you are saying in my head, this is the scenario I am covering. You don't want to hard code that in your machine, all right? You still want to describe what is the behavior of your machine. The behavior of the machine is when you power it up, it should do all its necessary stuff and then show you a message saying, please select a coffee type, all right? That's an important thing. Once I have seen this, then I can say user selects, or I'll, I'll tell you this pattern in a minute. So select, what do I want to select? Coffee type, black. And then when I do that, it should display, what should it display? Please insert 35 cents. Yes? Can everyone read this gibberish? Next, what should happen? Next, I want to insert what kind of coins? It is American coins only, right? Because the specification says that we want to accept American coins. We might at this point get a doubt, what is American coins, right? What is the heck American coins? Are we talking about Brazilian coins? Are we talking about American coins? What is American coins? US, Canada, Brazil. So that's some validation we need. But for now, 
software is pretty good because we can abstract that concept out and we can say American coins and we can later come back and say what specific American coins we need to deal with, right? So we want American coins and we want 35 cents and then what should happen? So I've inserted 35 cents, we could, we could say black coffee but I think it might be overkill. Uh, or we could also say thanks for your donation at this point, right? Depends how you want to design the system, what should be the behavior of the system. In this case, the behavior of the system is it should display, please collect your coffee. And if the user collects, what coffee? Coffee type should be black. Then what should happen? The user collected the black coffee, the system should go back in its original state. So far, is everyone with me? That's the system's problem. We'll get to that, right? Because the system has to do a whole bunch of things. Here we are not saying what the system should do. We are trying to capture what is the behavior that you expect out of the system from a user interaction point of view, right? So we will go into details where we will flush out how the system will behave and we will see how the design of your system will evolve through this process, all right? So I've done this. At this point, I have a failing acceptance test, all right? I need to get this failing acceptance test or behavioral test to work. So I'm going to go ahead and just create some scaffolding to make this work. So this is just some scaffolding stuff that I need to do. So bear with me for a second. What is this? This is the expected message, right? And we're going to say here assert equals that your expected message is the actual message. Where, how will we get the actual message? We'll figure that out later. That's not important for now. We just want to create the frame or scaffolding of this acceptance test. So we've got that. Then it's complaining that, hey, I don't know what this type black coffee is. So we're going to create an enum for now. Uh, For those who are interested in the details can pay attention, for others can just look at the approach we are taking. So we are saying here we want a coffee type and this should return this and let's go to the next one. This should again, we want, uh, you notice I am actually building my production code as I am going through this uh, because I am also flushing out the design as we are going through this and a lot of this is evolutionary design as we will see in a minute. So this is acceptance test. It didn't take it because I did a typo over here. And this should really be cents or coins, actually. And this should return this. The last thing we need to do is this. Same mistake here. This is your expected coffee type. Eclipse is not all that smart, right? You would think it would just fill that out. And here what I want to do again is I want to put an assert equals expected coffee type was actual dispensed coffee. All right, so far everyone with me? So what we've done is we've just gone and framed our tests, all right? Uh, this will help us move forward. This is one technique to do this. I'm going to also show you another technique where we're going to use a different tool where we don't have to get into code so much and we can do it quite nicely. But this is what we used to do 10 years ago and I wanted to kind of take you on this decade-long journey of behavior-driven development, all right? 
So let's run this bad boy at this point and see what happens. As expected, right, we are saying expected please collect, please select a coffee type but was null. The famous Java null pointer exception. So what do we need to do at this point? This is the stage where we need to do a little bit of design thinking, right? Now, what actually should happen when you power up the machine? If I power up the machine, what happens? If I power up a laptop, what happens, right? The BIOS kicks in, right? And the BIOS does whatever it needs to do and then gives control to the operating system to then take over. Right? For a simple coffee vending machine, we need a simple controller, a software controller that will take control and do its thing. Right? So we're going to get ourselves a controller, a new controller. Where will this new controller come from? We don't even have that, so we're going to go ahead and create one in our production code again. And we're going to store this away for a later point in time. So that's convert local variable. So we can use it. So if you power up, basically we are saying the hardware is going to instantiate the controller and give access to the controller and let the controller do whatever it needs to do. So when the, when the controller is powered up, what should happen inside the controller? It should do whatever its check and then display the message saying please select a coffee type, right? That's the expected behavior. So let's actually get ourselves a constructor in which when you initialize the machine, this is what should happen, right? So we're saying uh, do some check. Right now we don't have a case where we don't need to do a check, so I don't need to implement anything. We, we need to force ourselves to write a test which will force us to put the check in, right? So we're saying some check needs to be done and then a message needs to be displayed. Now again, back to design thinking. Whose responsibility it is to decide what message to display? The controller can make that decision, right? But who would actually display the message? The display panel, some kind of a display, right? And how would the controller know where the display is? Controller doesn't know where the display is, right? The hardware which instantiated the controller should give the, this, the controller saying here is the handle to the display, right? So let's go back to our acceptance test which is essentially our hardware, right? The acceptance test that we are writing is essentially our hardware. And this hardware is going to give you a display. But where is it going to get the display from? I'm going to teach you a technique which is called self-shunting. So I'm going to say, get me a display. Oh, this is Java, of course. So we need to write a little more code for this. Implements display. It says, hey, I've never heard of this guy. What do you want me to do? I want you to create a display for me in my production code. So I've got a display, now what? I can pass the handle to the display to my controller by simply doing this. Control one, change method signature to give a display. So hey, I've got a cheap display for myself by self-shunting and I'm gonna use this display to put the message that I want to put. So I'm gonna say display.show, please, select a coffee type, if I can type properly. Control one again, it says, what do you want me to do with this method? Create it on the interface and here I come back. This guy will complain. This is, I'm getting into a little more details and if you guys think it's getting too much into details, you let me know, I'll stop and I'll kind of zoom out and do something else, all right? But this will give you a feel for what this technique is all about. This dot actual message is what this message that got displayed over there. Now if I run my test, it says expected, please insert 35 cents, but got please select a coffee type. 
So if I actually look at this, uh, let's look at the next line. It says that, hey, I've successfully finished the first step of your process. Now I've moved to the second step of the process. So now we will go and flush out some behavior that will help us satisfy the second step in, the, in our scenario, right? So when somebody selects, actually let me pause at this point. So far, are you guys with me? Did you understand why I made all the circus? Why I, why I had to do all the circus around this? Right? There are better tools to actually do this which will make it much more simpler, but I, I like to take hard shots. Right? It will help you appreciate how these tools have evolved and what they are trying to do. Okay? So hopefully we will get there, we are running a little late. So when you select a coffee type, what should happen? When I press a button on the hardware, what should happen? Notice we are constantly jumping back and forth between designing, between implementing, between you know, deciding what the requirement should be. So we are kind of almost doing something that a lot of wisdom in the past has said is a bad thing to do, right? You should have a design phase. You should gather all the requirements. Then you should do the design phase. Then you should do your low level design. Then you should go write some code. We are saying, ah, not for me, right? Well, we'll just miss, mix this whole thing because this seems a lot more easier to make progress and this has many other advantages that we'll talk about in a minute. So I want to say when somebody selects something on the, when somebody presses a button, what would the hardware do? The hardware would send a signal to the controller saying, hey, this thing was pressed, right? So that's exactly what our test would do. We've got the controller, so it's going to say controller dot user selected or user wants, user wants this coffee type, control one, coffee type. So when the user selected a coffee type, what do we need to do? We need to display the price on the display, right? We need to show the price on the display. How, again, who will decide what the price should be? Is it the controller's responsibility? Not really the hardware, right? It has to be some other entity's responsibility, not the controller's responsibility. This is design thinking. We are designing as we are going along, right? So some people even call this behavior-driven design, right? So we are saying, okay, we've got a coffee type. We need to display the price for it, right? The display will display the message. The controller will decide what needs to do, but somebody else should decide what the price should be because that's not the controller's responsibility. So at this point, you might say, well, this is getting a little complicated, right? It's not as simple as I thought because there are a lot more interactions that we are getting here. So we might want to step back and look at one of the extreme programming practices of system metaphor. How many people have heard of system metaphor? One person? Okay. That's good. So you're in the right session. <laughs> system metaphor basically is a practice that Ken Beck came up with and he said when we are designing the system as we go along, right, it can get pretty hairy. So to make sure all of us are on the same page, can we find a common thing that we all know, a metaphor that we all know that we can keep referring to and then use that to drive the design of our system, right? So we are saying, okay, uh, we have all these entities and we want to figure out a common way for all of us to be on the same page. What's the closest metaphor we can find for this problem, right? One way to think about it is what are we trying to automate? We are trying to automate a small coffee shop which serves coffee, right? So is this kind of similar? Can we find a metaphor that can essentially take that and convert it into a software thing? So if you go to a small coffee shop, right? Many of you would have been to a small coffee shop. Who decides the price over there? As soon as you enter, typically there's a, there's a guy sitting on, on the table with all these little tickets, right? And you say, hey, I want a coffee. And the person says it's 35 rupees and gives you a token, right? So you go to the cashier and you ask the cashier, you want a coffee? The cashier says how much it is. Can we use that system metaphor in our problem and say we were going to you know, use that as our metaphor to drive our design. 
So what I need now is a cashier, right? So I need a cashier. So where are we going to get the cashier from? We're going to give an ad in the newspaper, but we can do this in software much easily. So we're going to again cheat the system by using the self shunting technique. I'm going to say, hey, give me a cashier. I need a cashier. So I've got a cashier, and then I'm going to do the same thing over here. Control 1, change this, and this is a cashier. All right, let's get this. And then we can say amount equals cashier dot what? Price for this coffee type. And then once we got that, we can say display dot show please insert sorry, it's been a while since I've written Java. All right, so please display uh, so we're going to say display dot please insert the amount and let's kind of get this to compile and that's pretty much it except we need to now write a method in our fake cashier which can give us the price. In my test can I hard code the price? We know the price is 35 cents so I'm going to just put here 35 cents right. Let's run this and it says hey no we don't want to see all the time now. It says please please collect your delicious coffee but was please insert 35 cents right. So we've now moved to the third step of our scenario. Was that easy? Yes, no? Correct. Good question, hold on to that, right? We will certainly come back and answer that, all right? Good question. Any other questions so far? So I'll come back to how we do unit testing, right? We're not doing any unit testing at this point. We're just describing the behavior of the system. We still have to do a whole bunch of unit tests, and when we do, we'll talk about that. How are we mixing it up? I, I believe we have done a very clean separation over here. We have a display which is responsibility is to display stuff. We have a controller whose responsibility is to decide what needs to happen, right? And we have a cashier whose responsibility is to handle all the price related stuff. Who needs to? Oh, MVC, that's like 17th century, so let's move away from that. We'll come back to that. Uh, I want to show, complete one scenario, then jump to the board and talk about the design and how this design will hold up, right, and how our behavior is flushed out the design. So I want to go ahead uh, and plow through this real quick. So when somebody inserts a coin, what needs to happen? probably need to do some validation but we don't have a scenario right now that helps us that forces us to do the validation so I'm not going to worry about that right we're going to write another scenario that will force us to to do the validation right here all I need to all I need to say to the controller is controller dot accept these coins you've got these coins please accept these coins right create this method so when you get these coins what do you do Yes, at some point we might need to do validations, but we don't need right now because we don't have a failing scenario for that, right? I know that I've got the exact change now. I don't even need to do any validations for the amount, right? So now I can straight away and say that I've got the money. I need to give the coffee. I need to serve the coffee. Let's go back to our system metaphor, right? What's our system metaphor? The small coffee shop. So you go to a small coffee shop, who gives you the coffee? Machine. No, we don't have a machine yet. That's what exactly we're trying to do. 
in uh, Bangalore we call that person a thambi. We say, thambi, can you get me a coffee? Right? Or in Chennai also they say that. Uh, if you want to be a little more sophisticated, then you call that person a barista. So a barista will serve you a coffee. Right? So we, we need a barista now. Where do we get a barista? We fake it out. So we've got a barista whose, go, whose responsibility is to, to make and serve the coffee, right? And that's again going to be injected into the controller. So now the controller has got the barista. So now we've done the validation and what do we do? At a later point in time when we have change to be returned, that will also happen, but right now we don't have a scenario which forces us to return the change. So all we need to do right now is we need to say, barista dot serve the coffee. We need the coffee. So we're going to come back here and say, hey, serve me not the coins, but the coffee. It says, I don't know this method, so let's create that method. Let's come here, and this guy should complain because it doesn't have a method to serve. So when the coffee is served, we can say this dot actual dispensed coffee is this coffee. Right? That was the coffee we asked it to dispense. The barista dispensed the coffee. We got the coffee. Let's uh, run this test, not in the debug mode. So, let's get out of that. So, it says, please collect your delicious coffee, but was, please insert 35 cents. Sorry? We have not changed the message. You know, see, I'm dumb. So, I make a mistake and I immediately find out that, hey, I am doing something that I'm not supposed to be doing, or I'm missing out stuff, right? So it's giving me feedback right away. Yes? So, yeah, so in 10 years of doing this, I've yet to come across a system where I didn't find a metaphor. So you show me a system where you cannot find a metaphor and let's have a conversation and I'll stand corrected, right? So in 10 years, I have built maybe 30 different systems and I've not come across a system where I couldn't find a metaphor. Metaphor is an extremely powerful practice and it helps you drive the design, right? So metaphors are important to make sure all of you are in, in sync with what I'm thinking in my head, right? So again, uh, I'm yet to find a system, but if we find one, I'll stand corrected. You may, we are not trying to model it exactly on the real world, but we are trying to say that, uh, you know, we need uh, this particular entity over here, some abstraction to do this bit of work, which currently does not belong to the controller, right? We are calling it barista because that's the metaphor we all understand, right? If it's something else, we will call it something else, right? Uh, I think Eclipse is hung, so I'm going to just kill it and bring it back up. There we go. This is good. Everything seems to be have hung at this point. Wow. <laughs> okay, so let it come back. In the meantime, I'm going to jump ahead and I'm going to show you what I was supposed to do after this, right? So, what we were trying to do here 
can I get rid of this coffee machine? So you guys let me know when that comes up. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. So we started with what I called as the acceptance test, right? And as we wrote the acceptance test, we started flushing out a few concepts. We said, hey, we need American coins, right? We need coffee type. These are abstractions that we started pulling out, right? We didn't go into implementing any of these. We just said this is an abstraction in the system we are trying to build, right? Then we said, hey, we need a controller, right? Then we said, the controller cannot do everything. The controller needs a display. Then we said, the controller also needs a cashier. The controller also needs a barista, right? And if we would have completed that loop, you would have actually seen the first test go green. Right? So we would have successfully finished one scenario end to end working. Does it do everything? Absolutely not. But did it help us make some progress in understanding what is the behavior and what is the design of this coffee vending machine? Yes? Right? So now I'm going to, you know, as we went through this, we had a lot of other scenarios that started coming to our head. Right? If you have a short term memory like I do have, then I would just note it down on a piece of paper and say, let me not lose focus for now. Let me make a note of it and continue till I finish this scenario. Then I'll come back to saying, okay, what if I run out of change, right? Or let's say, what if I ran out of, not coffee, but milk, right? We can also run out of coffee. We can run out of the coffee beans, but what if I ran out of you know, milk, what should happen? And you might, you might not know the answer for it. You might need to consult, you might need to consult a system expert who understands the system. Or if, if there is no system expert, you might want to do an A-B test. You might say, let's try these two possible things and see what users might, you know, like. You might go do a survey, you might actually build a prototype. There are many ways of dealing with that, right? But let's say, you know, we ran out of thing. We understand that if, if milk is not available, I can still serve a black coffee and I can serve a black coffee with sugar. So still two options are all possible, but two other options will not be possible. How do we know that? Whose responsibility it is, right? So on the barista, we had a serve method, right? We can say when the barista serves the coffee, it can tell back saying, hey, I no longer can serve these two coffees and I also will ring this bell so someone will come and fix this thing. Right? So we understand that's two additional behavior that our first scenario did not cover. So this guy now returns back what coffees it cannot serve, which then the controller needs to do what? Disable those buttons, right? The four buttons that we had, we might want to disable two of those buttons. So what we also realize is we need some kind of an abstraction of buttons over here, right? And this probably is all encapsulated inside some kind of a front panel which we will then you know, use to manage which buttons are turned on and which buttons are turned off and things like that. Right? So each scenario by scenario as you go through this, you're actually flushing out the design and you're starting building this thing. You're understanding what the behavior should be. You're capturing them as executable tests right? because these are executable tests. I can keep doing them. But notice one thing. Are all these guys implemented at this point? These are all just interfaces at this point, right? Yes? Now I could have spent maybe 30 minutes on this and I could have said, all right, I, I see a beginnings of a design of a system, right? Now let's get in more people, right? And give one team to build the display or one person to build the display. This is a clear contract of what the behavior of you know, the system is at this point in time. And the interface that we have flushed out tells you what is the contract. Yes? Then we move to the cashier. We can get one person to do that or a team to do that. We might realize that barista is a fairly complicated thing at this point. right? So we might actually need to write another acceptance test at the barista level to further flush out what the barista is 
You know, it might have different, different dispensers inside it. It might have a whole bunch of things inside it, right? So you might write another acceptance test. But when these guys start taking this and writing code, what would they do? Can they write a unit test now? Because they understand at a high level what is the behavior that is expected, right? So they can go in now and they can write a unit test over here saying, okay, for the cashier, when this, much, when this type of coffee is given, then this should be the price, right? I can write a unit test and then go write some code for it, right? And I can say, okay, when I need to get change, if I give $1, then the change should be so much, right? So I can unit test drive the cashier. Does that answer your question? Yes? I can unit test drive the display. But this might be fairly complicated, which I might not write a unit test, I might write an acceptance test, right? As these individuals start building out the system, we want to make sure the acceptance tests are passing all the time, right? That's the golden state of the system. And if this fails, then we know something is going wrong somewhere, right? So right from the beginning, you have something which is going to give you very early feedback. These tests are also going to evolve, by the way. You're going to add more tests. You're going to change this test if your behavior that you'd originally anticipated has now changed because the requirements have changed. You better understood the requirements, right? So that also happens. Yes? Can we unit test controller? Absolutely. Actually, if you see what we did, we actually unit test the controller. So what we're calling as the acceptance test is actually a unit test because we have stubbed all these guys out at this point. Right? We didn't have any of these guys implemented. Which all we had is interfaces. And we use a technique called self-shunting. You could use mocking, you could use stubbing, you could use spies, you could use simulators, you can use a whole bunch of faking techniques. And you could say, I have just unit tested my controller. Right? So I would go create, I would take, I would, at this point when I'm about to distribute the work, I would actually start with a, a controller test which might do some negative path testing at this point, which we've not taken care of, right? That might be more implementation level detail. That doesn't need to come here, okay? Correct, the acceptance test that you have where you have now faked them out, you would actually start hooking up one by one and that's what will tell you that these guys are not breaking the system, right? And this is how we have built fairly large complicated systems to start with. It is not a complicated system day one. Gradually it becomes complicated, right? But if you have this kind of behavior being defined at various level and automated right from the get-go, they are complicated but they are under check. So the, we, we, that would come into the barista. So her question was, if there is not sufficient milk or if there's not sufficient coffee, right, would there be another acceptance test? How do you measure that with a sensor? So that would drive that we actually need a sensor in this. Or there are cheaper techniques to do that. You could say that, you know, at this point, if it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get to, you know, there are very different techniques. So you could use weight, for example. You could use a small uh, electric point, which will say if this is, you know, touching the point, if it goes below that, it lights up something, it sends a message. Depends on what behavior, how sophisticated you want to build the system, right? It could send out a message, for example, to someone to come and fill. It could light up the bulb. So that's the behavior that you need to define as you go along. Right? Now, let's pause for a minute and say we did this, right? Is this going to lead us to a good maintainable design? Because our requirements keep changing all the time, right? How many people work in companies where your requirements never change? Yet to find one, right? There are a few people who do build systems like that and soon their companies shut down the shutters, right? Pull down the shutters because that, that doesn't work in real world, right? So let's say now our management figured out that, hey, you know what? Coffee is not a good business to be in. Coffee, people are getting health conscious and coffee is something that they want to avoid. But they are drinking soups. 
So we should be in the business of making these soup machines that can build soups, that can make soups, right? Now that happens, I've worked in many startups, I run my own startup and my developers can tell you how much we pivot, how much we change directions. So, you know, the management changed, decided to pivot and try something different. They say we want to do now soups. What would happen to all this effort that we put in? Throw it out? Will the display, the buttons, these change? Same. Will the cashier change? The data will change, but the logic remains the exactly same. Coffee type will change. Maybe we, we need some higher abstraction now. We might create a beverage, right? That's a higher abstraction and then you can do any kind of beverage. The barista certainly will change, right? But that's one part of the system that changed. Rest whole part of your system remains as is, right? So this is a fairly significant change. Now you can go in and write another acceptance test which would define how a soup machine should behave and then make the changes to the barista. Come up with a dispenser or some other kind of an abstraction which might have different things. You, your management could also decide that we want to do both, right? Will this allow you to do both? When you set up your system configuration, you could say, hey, this is a coffee machine, so instantiate a coffee uh, a barista. This is a soup machine, so instantiate something else. So what I'm trying to get at is requirements change all the time. And you know, this technique helps us uh, come up with a fairly decoupled design, helps us deal with evolving requirements as we go along, and caps capture them as automated tests. So we can keep validating and distribute work and still be fairly confident that things didn't break randomly. Okay? So that is, is in, in uh, a nutshell what uh, behavior driven development would look like. All right? This has been applied at very large systems that I have built. This has been applied at simple systems we've built and this technique seems to work fairly well. I do want to show a couple of other things but let's take a few questions before that. Yeah, sure. We, I, I wanted to do that, yes. Any other questions? Has my machine come back from a hanging state? Not yet. The rainbow, the beach ball is still there. So I am afraid this might not work. That's It is an acceptance test. It's different from an integration test. An integration test would only focus on how two components would talk to each other. It has no business whatsoever from a functionality or logic point of view. An integration only is about whether this point can communicate with this point or not. Right? We do both, as, as we were discussing earlier. Uh, so her question is, in this style, do we do only unit test, do we do only acceptance test, or do we do both? And the answer is we do both because one is a business-facing test, which we wrote, which is more from a user's perspective or from a business perspective. But there is also tests that need to validate the implementation of your things, right? How you're actually implementing something. So as I was describing at this point, when somebody tries to implement this, they would actually write unit tests and drive the behavior, will drive the implementation of the cashier, right? So we will do both. Sure. So uh, just to jump ahead and kind of summarize what your question is, in this case, these different components that we have can directly talk to each other via method calls, right? 
but there will be systems when it will not be a simple method call. It could be a distributed system where I have to make a remote call or I need to send a message. I need to put something on the message queue and it will do something, right? So what would we do? Where would we write? At what level would we write the acceptance test? We would still write the acceptance test there. Whether it does a method call, whether it's a remote thing, that's again implementation detail, right? Your acceptance test should not worry about your implementation detail. We will have unit tests and we will have integration tests and we will have other kinds of tests to make sure whether you can make the remote calls correctly, whether you can do these things correctly or not. Right? So that's an implementation detail. The acceptance test doesn't care. The acceptance test cares how a user would use your system or how a business process would take place or any of those things. Okay? We'll go there. Okay. Sure. The second thing is uh, basically an outside in, outside in behavior which would flush out your high level interfaces and things like that. Okay, but you can further go take the same approach and drill it further down. Like I was explaining, the barista is fairly complicated, right? So let me flush the barista further down again from the same perspective. I might actually not even build barista myself. I might just buy an off-the-shelf component which does this, right? But then I can define what is the off-the-shelf component needs to do from a behavior point of view, hook it in and see if it matches. Maybe write an adapter in between to do what I want to do exactly. Okay, so that's the second thing. What else? That's the two things. Anybody else? Can, you want to add to these, other than these two things, what is the outcome of this BDD approach? Emerging the design, right? Which kind of is similar to the second point, but I think it's more around the evolving, the emerging design. Things is the evolutionary design, right? Okay, that's good. So, looks like you guys are getting the hang of it. What else? Are there any other advantages or outcome of this? Okay. So, we actually did stub out the behavior, right? It will be actual calls. However, the unit test for the controller would continue the same thing. What we just did would continue as the unit tests. Obviously, more uh, implementation specific tests would be added to the controller unit test, but the acceptance test would actually remove one by one all the faking that we did and actually integrate with the real system. Uh, then we will have to talk about what level of acceptance test are we talking because there are different levels of acceptance test. Are we talking about business logic acceptance test? Are we talking about workflow acceptance test? Are we talking about end to end acceptance test? So there are actually three different levels of acceptance test. The end to end acceptance test should actually integrate cut and cut through the whole system, right? The business logic acceptance test might only go specific to your module because your module itself is fairly complicated, right? Like the, the acceptance test over here. This only deals with barista, it doesn't care about the other things at this point. So that it's, it depends at what level we are talking. This level is generally end to end, it integrates with the whole thing. There is, you know, this level might have touch points with other guys and it might just simulate the behavior of other things using any of the mocking techniques, any of the faking techniques or any of the simulation techniques. There are tools like uh, Lisa, for example, which can actually record a whole sequence of things when that system is available. When the system is not available, it will just act as if you're talking to the real system and produce the same uh, output for you, right? So that's again another technique you could use. So there are a whole bunch of different techniques that can be used, okay?
So that seems like a problem to me uh, with the way the acceptance tests are written, frankly, rather than the, uh, that's, that's not a common problem, let's put it this way, that's not a common problem I've seen on large systems. There's a system on which I worked, we had 36,000 acceptance tests that we had written. Some of them were built by, you know, ex-doctors and nurses, and they were building this stuff. It was fairly decoupled from your schema because this is business facing. This is not technology implementation facing. And you need to abstract these things nicely out into some kind of a DSL, right, which will deal with your low level implementation. So changes in your business logic, changing in, changes in your workflow should be decoupled fairly from your schema changes or your implementation details, right. So I think that separation might be is what is missing which is causing these small changes over here in your implementation causing these to change the acceptance test so that's something you might want to you know have a look at correct it's more business facing more user facing rather than more database or you know things like that facing because that's implementation stuff Correct. It is all real things. What I'm saying is, you know, you're just, uh, you know, abstracting them, encapsulating them in a nice component, which will deal with those things, right? I don't need to. So we used, for example, on one project where we do e-learning, we used Selenium to actually drive and build our acceptance test, right? So what Selenium would do is we wouldn't say, you know, in Selenium, we would just say, you know, buy the, a particular thing. We didn't go into details of saying what exactly happens, you know, we didn't have everywhere saying buy means these tents different click on this, click on this, click on that. That is encapsulated inside one thing, which means now if there is a change in the buy thing, I just need to touch that one point, none of my other things would change, right? But it still would use the same thing. Yeah. Hang on, let me finish please, all right? So that abstraction is what I'm talking about is very important, okay? Yes, please. But shouldn't that be the responsibility of the person who's writing the code, right? So that person cannot say I'm done unless it's integrated with the database, the schema is up to date, everything's hooked up, it's working good, right? And then only they can say, okay, this particular story or this particular feature or subset of the feature is actually implemented, right? So that should be the responsibility of the person who says, hey, I made this change to this code and it is working with the latest greatest schema and the acceptance test is validating that end to end everything is working fine, right? It should not be a second step. It should be part of that development cycle, okay? Uh, my systems come back up. I want to quickly show a couple of other uh, tools that can be used. So you actually appreciate this whole process. I'm uh, running over time, right? We're supposed to finish at 5.30. So if you want to leave, that's perfectly fine. We have actually nothing else up till six, so I'm gonna just eat into that time, all right? So let's look here. Can everyone see the screen? So what I wanted to show you is two other tools. Uh, I was one of the contributors to a tool called Fitness. And I'm going to show you Fitness for a second, and I'm going to show you Cucumber. Those are two tools that can be also used for writing acceptance tests. Mm, that's what I want. is uh, I'm, I'm going to show you something real world, right, rather than a toy code. This is, uh, this is a domain forwarding server that I built for a company where I worked. Uh, is everyone familiar with what a domain forwarding server is? A domain forwarding server, this is an intranet, uh, this is an internet company. What they do is they provide infrastructure. I have two websites, nareshjain.com 
and NareshJain.in. All right, I have two different websites uh, or two different domains. Would I maintain two different websites for them? No, I want you know when somebody requests for NareshJain.in, I want it to basically redirect to NareshJain.com. There are a couple of ways of doing that. I might want to actually do a permanent redirect and show the URL as NareshJain.com. Or I might want to do a URL masking, which means it will still show NareshJain.in, but the content is actually served from NareshJain.com. Right? So there are different techniques of doing that, and there's a server called the domain forwarding server, which essentially handles this. So what you're seeing is acceptance tests or acceptance criteria for a domain forwarding server. So this says inactive domains uh, should result in bad requests. So we have this domain which should be forwarded to google.com, but it's not active because they've not paid or they've disabled. So when the user requests for URL, this URL, then the header status should be 400, which means bad request, right? So that's an acceptance test. I can do other things like this. So this is active, which means they have actually activated it. When user requests for this domain, then the header status should be 301, which is a permanent redirect. And now the new location of your browser should be google.com, right? I can run this. It's a click of a button, and I can run this. What actually happened when I did this? If you notice here, oops, sorry. If you notice here, it actually connected to a database. It cleaned certain things from the database. It inserted a domain uh, in my database. I want to do URL masking, so which means when I request for this domain, the header status should be 200. Uh, obviously, this is, this is not for anyone to just look at it and understand. You need to have some basic understanding of the domain, right? And then we are saying when this thing is requested, your fame source should now be google.com slash blog, which means subdomain should become slash blog. That's the business logic that we have. And that's what we've captured here as this thing, right? So this is one tool which we use to capture acceptance tests. Someone would go write, this is a wiki. So I can go into this, edit this thing, and I could say, you know what, header station should be actually 403. This is my behavior. I've changed this. Let me run this. And it says expected 403 because that's what we said we expect. But actual was 404. So it's actually going, hitting the server, getting the status back, and verifying what's going on. Let me fix this. And so does this make sense? What we just did with the coffee vending machine can actually be captured again like this, steps over here in a wiki. Right? And there is some glue code that sits behind it, which will essentially drive your system, which will poke around your system. Like our, you know, our acceptance test was actually doing all of this stuff by calling methods on the controller and everything. That's what this thing would be doing for you. And I want to lastly show another tool, which is called Cucumber, which can do something similar. So in Cucumber, you can write you know, pretty much English-like statements. Uh, and it was originally written for Ruby, but these days it's available in most languages. So here we are saying feature is bad request, and the scenario is domain not hosted by our server company. Uh, server results in a bad request, and you're saying given this is a context, which means we are not hosting this server. When the browser sends a request for this, then the header page should not be served. Uh, the page should not be served, and the header status should be 404. Right? This is fairly just plain text English. And we're saying this plain test English is essentially our acceptance criteria, our acceptance test, which would drive our business logic and poke around and validate if things are going fine. So again, will this just work without anything? It obviously needs some code behind it to make this work, right? So this is what we have written is what we call as the feature file, which describes what your scenarios are, right? And there would be a step definition file which is here. So this is all our step definitions. Each of those lines that you saw in there, uh, in this thing, is a step definition. This one is more complicated. It has a whole bunch of other stuff. Each one is a step definition, and we are saying that you know, there's certain things that needs to happen. It basically uses regular expression to match what you're giving, take important pieces of information out of it, and pass it down to your system. Like here, we are doing this business with you know, creating a new domain, setting certain things on it, and storing the domain in the database. OK? Yep. Can this step definition be in any language 
Yes, the step definitions can be in any language of your choice. In fact, it was originally built in Ruby, but as you can see, this is written in Java. It can be written in other languages as well. If a particular language you use and it's not there, you can build one because it's fairly easy. For fitness as well, they have drivers which can work in different languages, right? So these are all tools that I'm showing you are language agnostic. Uh, these, you know, each one has a language specific implementation. Yes, yeah, so when we write these, then we can actually go and run our tests over here, which run cucumber tests. And as you can see, it ran 101 tests. Let's step through these. These are three top level features that we have, bad request, permanent redirect, and URL masking, right? Uh, well, let's look at permanent redirect. Permanent redirect has these scenarios that we have covered, and each of these scenarios have actually gone poked around, it has a bunch of steps that is done and it's validated whether things are working or not. Right? So it kind of gives you a nice description. And this can also be run, all of these tools can be run as part of your continuous integration process, which is really the idea that anytime somebody checks in the code, it would run all of these and make sure that you didn't accidentally break any of the existing functionality. Right? So, Yeah, these are, you, you automated your acceptance tests. And this is an automated test, that's correct. Uh, so I was not there in the session, but uh, I will say yes. <laughs> All right. Cool. So you see it how it works. The mystery is solved now. All right. Any other questions? That's pretty much it. The show is over. Put your money down on the table if you're happy and leave. I'll be around if you have any questions for me. All right. Thank you.